Hey folks, Alcris here. I'm going to be walking through what I think are the relative strengths and weaknesses for each nation in Old World with an eye towards multiplayer play. So in multiplayer, generally you're going to see more of an emphasis on military, and you're going to be focused more on combat and the ability to deliver uh, overwhelming force to your opponent's units and eventually quickly destroy their cities. Um, generally multiplayer conflicts tend to resolve after a very large battle or indecisive battle. Um, can be pretty hard to come back after losing a lot of units. Not always though, you can definitely come back sometimes. So I'm going to be looking at these nations primarily with a focus on that multiplayer, uh, which prioritizes things like training uh, or other aspects of old world. Most importantly in multiplayer, you cannot do diplomacy with your opponent because they're another human. I mean, you can over Discord or chat, um, but there's nothing in game that stops them from attacking you. You can make a peace treaty, but they can break it the next turn and backstab you. Uh, so the best preparation for uh, da danger is essentially to have a strong military force that dissuades them from attacking you in a FFA or, or in a duel. Um, you want just to have more strength as the opponent so that you can choose when you want to attack them uh, at a moment that works well for you, generally when you get some sort of tech advantage or when you upgrade a bunch of units or uh, unlocking a key technology or a wonder or something that lets you get an advantage with units that you have. You want to be thinking about uh, when you want to attack. So with that preface in mind, let's start talking about the nations. So Rome is uh, probably the strongest nation or one of the strongest nations for multiplayer. And this largely is because of its two bonuses here. For every city that Rome has, it gets two training a turn. That means it gets more training than any other civilization, everything else being held equal. Uh, since multiplayer is generally a game where you have to create units and fling them at your opponent, uh, being able to build more units faster than anyone else is an incredible strength. Additionally, Rome has plus one fatigue limit. That means its units can move faster, further, every turn than uh, other nations. Uh, essentially, it's the same bonus that the Zealot leader has, which we'll talk about a bit later, uh, but it applies all the time. All Roman units can do this uh, at all times. So instead of just moving three moves a turn, they can move four. Uh, or this applies to workers as well, and scouts, it's, it's quite strong. Let's talk about starting techs for Rome. Ironworking, uh, very strong tech. It gates labor force, which gets you slavery, which you need orders, which gets a source of early orders. Um, also leads towards husbandry, uh, which gets you pastures, and is a prerequisite for steel, which is axemen. Stone cutting, always useful. There's never enough stone. In Old World, you always want more stone. Everything takes stone. Wonders take stone. Buildings take stone. You just need more stone. And Polis, this one lets you build hamlets right away as Rome. Probably less useful for multiplayer, uh, although hamlets can be nice to expand borders or grab a particular resource. Uh, and also on the way to forestry, although that might not be something you prioritize depending on your map size with Rome. But ironworking and stone cutting are both very solid texts to start with. Roman millet, the Roman unique unit is called the Hastatus, or the Legionary, in its upgraded form. This is essentially a super maceman. The key thing to keep in mind about this unit is it has uh, plus 25% versus infantry units, which actually is less than what macemen do, uh, or I think it's about what macemen do, less than swordsmen. Swordsmen are plus 50%. Um, but it also has Testudo, which gives like a super fortified just against ranged units, which can be helpful in static positions. Um, I'm not too enamored with this unit. It's, it used to ignore zone of control, but it no longer does. Uh, in exchange, I think it had its Testudo buffed to be a three turn uh, instead of a five turn. Uh, but it's still, it, it's nice, but it, it's pretty expensive to build. Can be useful if you're facing someone who's building a lot of infantry, thanks to that uh, Centurion bonus. Um, infantry is basically anyone not on a horse and not siege. So all these units here. Uh, so slingers are infantry, ax archers are infantry, axemen, all those, but not anyone mounted and not anyone who's a siege unit. Uh, so it can be strong there, um, but at the same time, it's pretty expensive to build at 120 training. Um, so yeah, I mean, you it, it lets you essentially ignore teching the mace uh, axe, the axe, mace, swords tree, because your unique unit fills that same sort of niche. Um, which, which can be handy if you want to save tech and tech something else. Let's talk about Roman shrines. 
Shrine of Mars. This is the training XP shrine. You give it like a Rax that also gives you plus two training. Nicely synergizes with everything else Rome does in terms of giving you more training. Um, the Shrine of Vulcan, another training shrine. This one gives you one training per adjacent lumber mill. A little harder to set up, but if you can find a nice spot surrounded by forests and then get lumber mills on all those forests, you can get up to six training from the shrine, which is pretty significant. Couple that in your champion seat and you might see some very, very nice training uh, if you have some forests in your champion seat. Shrine of Venus, this shrine, probably nothing to write home about, plus one growth um, and plus 20% for adjacent pastures. And then the Shrine of Vesta, this is a culture shrine and gives you a little bit of gold per adjacent resource. So usually you'll try to find two or three resources that are clumped together and in range of the shrine and it's a nice little gold bonus. So let's talk about the Roman families, uh, the champions family, the landowners family, patrons and statesmen. Uh, champions, again, just beautifully tie in with everything Rome does. It's a military family, so it gets that two training a turn. It has plus 25% training in its seat, so that champion seat can just become a military production machine. Importantly, its new units start with steadfast, which means champion families are great for early combat against barbarians and tribes because they do 25% more damage uh, to them and take 25% less damage effectively because of combat strength uh, against tribal units. You also get a warrior uh, when they start, so you basically get two warriors to start out as Rome if you found with a champion city. Uh, that can be very strong. Interesting, their luxuries are wine and dyes. Dyes means you're going to need to find something on the coast that has, and wine means you're probably going to want to find land consolidation pretty early uh, to keep those families happy. The landowner's family uh, is also a great family. You might consider founding your Roman capital with landowners uh, because of its growth bonus and that amazing minus 50% rural specialist production time, which is very, very significant. Uh, as well as two culture built crop resources, which on the right site with a lot of crop resources can be very, very strong because it gives you a lot of culture. That's wheat, barley, sorghum, and citrus. And conveniently, the family seat has two tile, can buy tiles, uh, even before you unlock colonies from navigation. This lets you potentially expand uh, your landowner's seat very quickly, even before you can buy tiles normally. Um, and it can be very, very valuable depending on where you are with that landowner's seat or what sort of resource you want to grab. You can basically make that first city a super city by buying up tiles appropriately. Also gets two citizens, which is a nice little bonus. Uh, resources are honey, uh, which requires land consolidation, and olives, which also requires lands con land consolidation. Uh, so you may want to get land consolidation if you are using Rome with landowners, just because otherwise your landowners will be very, very unhappy. Patrons, this is an interesting city, an uh, uh, interesting family for Rome. They get two civics for every turn in their family cities and two culture per specialist. Uh, so very strong if you can find uh, somewhere where you're going to be building a lot of specialists. Interestingly, all their family cities can hurry projects with money. This can be very useful in a pinch. Um, projects are things like forums and de decrees are also projects as are inquiries. Uh, the family seat gets one discontent level reduction per culture event, and you get a courtier when you found uh, your patron seat, which is nice if you need someone to tutor your kids. Um, pretty good family, uh, but I'd, I'd rate it slightly lower tier, and I would usually pick as my third family as Rome, statesmen. Statesmen are basically the order family. They give you an order per every city that you have. They also uh, actually outproduce patrons in, in uh, civics because they give you a civic per turn, per family opinion level. Family opinion, if we can get the tooltip here, uh, basically is goes from angry to upset to sort of neutral to pleased to friendly. Uh, those are five opinions. So a maxed ha happiness family is actually going to give you five a turn. And even a neutral one, I believe, is giving you three civics a turn. Family seat can do decree. Decree is pretty amazing in that you can uh, use run this project over and over again and get... Um, orders every turn and more orders is incredibly useful and great for your flexibility you can also found with a treasury uh, which is nice and um, every city actually in the statesman gets uh, treasury so they get 100 gold on founding each city so it's a nice little bonus and 10 to turn uh, you don't have to build that treasury and uh, you get uh, 400 civics when you found your seat which is very nice for picking up your first law uh, there their luxuries that they care about are pearls, which again, you'll need to find shoreline with pearls. 
um, and wine, which is also behind land consolidation. Rome starts with a tactician. Uh, tactician, as an archetype, can be very strong in the early game uh, because if you general your leader on, as a tactician, you can stun enemy units uh, and they can't do anything for the entire turn and then you can stun them again and again until they're dead or until you stun something else. That does reduce the combat strength of that unit, so you'll probably want to put on a ranged unit that you can keep in the back lines. Um, and this is kind of fun, uh, your ranged units are all hidden in friendly or neutral trees, so you can create some pretty cool sneak attacks with tacticians. Tacticians also have wisdom and discipline, which is uh, both wisdom is, is very, very good, uh, and discipline is nice to have, especially now with some recent buffs where uh, it has actually a significant amount of gold on your leader. All right, that's Rome. Let's move on to Persia. Persia is my favorite sieve. They have the special aspects of plus 50% harvest production, which is very nice for getting early culture, especially in your capital if you want to get to developing quickly so that you can uh, hurry production with civics or some other form of rushing. Um, and importantly, minus 25% cost for range units, which is very nice because it applies to their unique unit, as well as half an order per pasture. Half an order per pasture may not seem like much, but it actually adds up quite a bit if you think you've got a bunch of different pastures, uh, let's say you've got 10 pastures across your empire. Uh, that, that is very significant. Pastures are anything like horses, cattle, sheep, pig, and goats. You probably have 10 or maybe 20 of them. Uh, that's a lot of extra orders a turn um, just for being Persia. So Persia probably has the strongest order economy in the game. They also have the statesman family there, so they can couple that and continue to strengthen their order economy. Um, so starting text, Persia also starts with ironworking, trapping, which is very nice, uh, considering they have a hunter family, which we'll talk about in a bit, and husbandry. Uh, interestingly, Persia starts with all the prerequisites for chariots unlocked. They can get spoked wheel right away uh, after their first tech selection, which means they can chariot rush faster and better than anyone else. It's part of the reason they're my favorite uh, civilization. Their unique unit is a ranged horse that has a route. As a horse unit, it ignores zone of control. It's ranged, which means it benefits from Persia's minus 25% cost for building it because it is ranged, and uh, it has a route, which means it can attack again after it defeats an enemy unit. Uh, this is very, very strong, uh, probably the strongest unique unit just because of its speed, mobility, uh, and what it can do. Persia has that same lumber mill shrine that Rome had, which is very good. Again, just find a nice, nice bit of forest surrounded by lumber mills, and congrats, you've got up to six training uh, in that city, which is very, very good. It's got an order shrine, which is very solid as well early game getting a half order for a shrine is very nice as well as 20 percent for a farm you're usually going to be focused on growth early so if you can find somewhere where you're adjacent to two farms or even just one with a special resource uh, that can get some extra growth and some extra orders this is the gold and nets uh, shrine probably not that useful not one of the great shrines um, just because you, you usually are not going to be trying to build a shrine next to the water uh, so you might just want to use this one as I'm going to grab a resource and expand my borders using the shrine. And then lastly, the shrine of Mithra. This one gives ranged units plus one level, which is very nice because, again, Persia's unique unit is a ranged unit um, and gives 20% for camps. So if you have a city that is, let's say, is a hunter city that has camps because you want camps for hunters, which I'll talk about here in a second, um, shrine of Mithra can fit very well in that because you put it next to the camps and then all the ranged units, like your unique unit, that pop out of that hunter city get an extra level. So let's talk about families for Persia. Family, uh, they ha their military family is riders, and riders as a military family gets two training a turn. Their cities also start connected. This is a weird sort of connected because it's not a real connected. It's connected in the sense that they, let's see here, it's connected in the sense that, well, that's not a great tool to, it's connected in the sense that it reduces their discontent and also gives a bit of money, but it doesn't actually count as connected. So if you build hamlets in that family, they won't uh, get 20 gold, they'll only be 10 gold unless they're also on your trade network. Uh, so I guess there's a distinction between connected and on your trade network. Um, and the rider families are connected in that they don't have the discontent penalty, but they're not on the trade network. So you'll still probably want to uh, pull a road to them, but it's not as urgent uh, because they're not facing that discontent penalty either. Uh, the biggest thing about riders is their mounted units. And again, Persia's unique unit is mounted. You see how, the, how this nation really ties together. Start with Saddleborn. Saddleborn is a pretty incredible bonus in that it gives you 25% attack strength if you're flanking. Flanking essentially means you've got a unit on the friendly unit on the other side of the unit that you're attacking. 
Fortunately, your unique unit is very mobile and chariots are also very mobile and you start with all both of those things unlocked. So you've got a melee horse unit that you can use and a melee ranged unit. Uh, once you get to your unique unit, so you surround a unit and then you flank it, well, not surround, just, just be on either side and then you do 25% additional damage and then uh, you can route and keep going to the next unit. Very, very great. For your rider seat, uh, the magic thing it does is it does not actually require horses in that city, so you can found a rider seat somewhere where you don't see horses. Uh, so potentially if you see a site that just has ore and no horses, that's still a great rider seat because you'll get the horses thanks to it being the rider seat. Again, your seat is your first family city. Um, and also you get the scout. Uh, you get an additional scout as soon as you far found your rider's seat. This is very, very strong uh, because scouting early lets you get legitimacy from discovering things, naming things, finding goody huts, uh, and that'll get you more orders, which lets you scout more. So getting, especially in multiplayer, being able to scout and find those goody huts before your opponent can be very, very strong, uh, as well as just having a second scout around to have vision on your opponent, have vision on other things you want to harvest, again, tying in with versus bonus, all very, very great. Riders care about salt and fur as their luxuries. Uh, conveniently, none of these uh, require land consolidation. So if your riders are your key family for Persia, you may not actually need to pick up land consolidation at all. Their next family that is the Hunter's family, another military family. So Persia, uh, unlike Rome, actually has two military families. It's one of the two civilizations in the game that has two military families. It gives you two training per turn. Uh, its range units start with Sentinel. Let me see if I can tooltip over there. Sentinel is very, very strong in that it gives you 20% strength while you're in your borders. So if you're forward settling an opponent or just fighting a defensive war, your ranged units that are of the hunter family are 20% stronger than any other unit that you make. And despite being a military family, hunters have camps and nets giving you 100% output. That means that you can uh, really get a lot of growth, anything like a game. That normally would give two growth now gives four growth um, the culture is doubled from fur the orders from camels and elephants is doubled as well and similarly for nets the culture and the money and the food all that is really doubled and it's really pretty incredible uh, you can get some absurd amounts of growth and just have a hunter city with a couple camps uh, immediately get up to 20 growth or something and just start pumping out settlers like no tomorrow persia uh sorry hunters also get hunt as a project um, this basically gives you it's a project so you you spend civics every turn in a city and you get uh some permanent growth that's added to the city as well as a bit of food this is pretty underwhelming i can say i've almost never built this on founding your hunter seat you also get 50 iron 50 stone and 50 wood this is really really nice especially when you're playing on the highest difficulty the great where you have no starting resources whatsoever uh, depending on what the terrain is for your founding city can be making a lot of sense if you've got a lot of camps and nets to actually found as hunters. They care about fur and honey. Honey is a land consolidation resource, but fur should be pretty easily available and also nicely dovetails with uh, camps, which will give you extra bonus. Clerics are the third uh, Persian family. Um, clerics are really the, the gimmick with cleric is you're guaranteed a religion if you found with a cleric family seat so that's that's the nicest thing and the family seat produces disciples faster than anything else there are temples and monasteries for family cities produce more output than others you can build urban improvements on sand which can be nice depending on the map you're on although it's usually not that useful oops didn't mean to click that and then their family cities also get minus one discontent to turn i think base discontent on the great is something around 14 or so so that's not particularly significant uh, they also have two land consolidation resources as the, two land consolidation luxuries as their resources that they want incense and lavender uh, which can be pretty awkward to find and or build um, so unless you're particularly going for something around clerics using clerics in some way to get that early religion um, maybe you have a random leader that is a zealot uh, or something like that then it may not be may not be great uh, to go with clerics I, I generally do not pick clerics unless I'm, I'm trying something around religion and then they have statesmen. This is just like the Roman statesman family um, and does all the same things. Uh, again, this sort of contributes to Persia having the best order economy of the game because you have a bunch of statesmen cities giving you orders. You've got a bunch of pastures that are giving you orders, extra orders, thanks to being Persia. Uh, you're running decree to get more orders. You're just swimming in orders uh, and crushing your opponent with your superior orders. Meanwhile, you've got two other families, riders and hunters that are military production that give uh, mounted units uh, saddleborn, so they are flanking at 25% extra damage. 
um, and Sentinel, in case you're fighting a defensive war, you've got 20% strength. So two very strong military families plus statesmen, uh, very, very strong. Persia's starting leader is a hero. And heroes are probably the strongest single archetype uh, in the game in terms of winning military battles. And the reason for this is because they, if you're a hero leader, uh, is the general uh, of a unit, they can launch offensive. And launch offensive essentially lets you reset your attack cooldowns for all your adjacent units, give them an extra order, which enables them to attack again, uh, even if they attack that turn. So if you're, let's say you've got a little hex of six Paltan cavalries um, with a hero unit, a hero general, leader general in the middle, um, that launch offensive can now attack twice with seven units, which is pretty crazy strong. Um, you can just break enemy armies right there, and especially with route and careful positioning, you can do some pretty incredible things. You're gaining additional orders for that as well. Uh, it does cost 600 training, uh, but fortunately, um, you get 40 training per military unit you kill as a hero leader as well, and your units can heal with while pillaging. That one, I can say I almost never pillage, um, so that one seems less useful to me, um, but presumably if you were trying to pillage, you could, it could be useful, but not really a big deal. Heroes are also very nice as generals uh, in the early game, even if they're not your leader, because they can heal in neutral territory, which means you can use it while clearing barbs. You don't need to retreat to your borders to heal. You can just heal right where you are. All right, let's move on to Greece. Greece starts with uh, the, the sort of key thing to keep in mind with Greece is, yeah, they start with a project uh, Olympiad, but that's not the key thing. The key thing is they get two culture a turn for every city. This is nice, similar to Rome sort of giving two training a turn. Greeks gets two culture a turn in every city. Their settlers are also cheaper, which makes them be able to expand faster than any other uh, nation because they can build more settlers faster, although Persia with a good hunter site or any other hunter sieve uh, potentially can do that as well, but Greece doesn't need any setup. It's just something they get for free. And then Olympiad is a project that basically lets you build training uh, with civics in a city and get some training and perma training. We do it probably not great, nice as a filler, but there's probably other things you can do uh, with your city's build queue, which is precious. Starting texts for Greece are ironworking and stone cutting. These are great. Um, and then drama. Drama means that Greece actually has the shortest path to Port Colis um, because that can unlock Spymaster, um, or one of the shorter paths to Port Colis, um, and that get the science bonus from Spymaster there. Drama also means Greece can even settle faster because they start with free settler unlocked, so they can get a settler from research as well as uh, building settlers in their cities. Their unique unit is the Hoplite, or upgrade to Phalangenite. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. Um, this is sort of like a super spearman um, and is very nice actually because it fills a gap in the tech tree. Um, spearmen are available pretty early and then there's nothing until the eight strength pikemen far, far down at the other end of the tree. Hoplites fill into that and are very, very strong in melee combat against mounted units. What that means is if a hoplite is fighting a mounted unit, it gets 50% combat strength in melee. So either the hoplite is attacking the mounted unit or the mountain unit is melee and is attacking the hoplite. That means Persia's unique unit, the ranged uh, cataphract archer, actually is weirdly affected by this in that if the hoplite attacks the cataphract archer, it's 50% stronger. But if the cataphract answer fires back because it's not a melee attack, it's a ranged attack, the uh, phalangite does not get that bonus. But that means phalangite can be very good at stopping anyone who goes for a pure horse strategy because congrats, their units are now 50% stronger on offense, and if your horse units are melee units, uh, they are 50% stronger as well. We also start with formation, which means they're 20% more defensive if they're next to each other, and they also have pierce, which means they uh, pierce essentially attacks the next unit behind that unit at 25% strength, uh, just like spearmen, essentially. Greek shrines are, they have what I call the science shrine, that gives you one science a turn, and then a civic turn per adjacent courthouse unit. Um, the adjacency bone is probably not something to worry about, just think of this as a plus uh, science, although can be useful potentially if, if in case you're trying to build a civics city like that we're going to talk about here in, in a bit. Um, for sages, uh, if, you, if you want to align your courthouses around your shrine, that can get you some additional civics. This is a shrine of Poseidon. Uh, this is the same shrine that we saw um, 
for Persia, was it? Or no, is it? Yeah, it was Persia. This is, yep, Shrine of Athena, Shrine of Poseidon, not Athena, Shrine of Anahita. Uh, this is the money and nets adjacency strength shrine. They also have a shrine that we haven't talked about yet, the Shrine of Hades, which is what I call the Mountain Volcano Culture Shrine. Basically, this shrine will pump out a bunch of culture if it's surrounded by mountains, and especially if it's next to a volcano. You can potentially get five, six, even more culture if you find the perfect spot for it. But generally, you'll want to build this at least when it's giving you uh, four or five or six. And then the Shrine of Zeus, this is another culture shrine, um, which gives you two culture per turn, or sorry, not culture, civics per turn, and then a additional order per adjacent wonder. So again, with careful planning and figuring out where you're putting the shrine and figuring out what order, what wonders you want, you can get a couple additional orders. Uh, the nice thing here really is that civics bonus, um, and we'll talk about sort of that next. So family-wise, they have champions just like Rome in all the same sense of the word. Uh, so everything that Roman champions do, Greek champions can do as well. All of that great. So they're very good in terms of training. They have a new family that we haven't chatted about yet, artisans. Artisans are kind of like your mine lumber mill super family, plus they pump out a bunch of additional culture. Notice that they've got four culture per turn for every artisan city, and Greek's bonus, recall, is two culture a turn. So an artisan Greek city is adding four, six, four plus two equals six culture a turn, which is an incredible amount of culture to start without having done anything at all. Uh, so you'll advance cultural levels faster in your artisan cities, and there's a strong case to be made for sometimes, especially in single player, uh, to be founding artisan as Greek, but uh, potentially even in multiplayer, there are situations where you're like, hmm, this city looks like it has a lot of mines and lumber mills. Um, I, I can actually do uh, culture and the family seat turning the minus two turns to build urban improvements means you can get buildings up faster and you get an extra worker. Oh, it's just so delightful to have an artisan family. Oh, and on top of that, their siege and ship units start with ingenuity. Ingenuity is pretty incredible. It's 20% strength straight up for all your siege and ship units. Ship units probably not going to see much play in multiplayer apart from fun things on Archipelagio, uh, but siege units are amazing uh, and can be very strong, and having them 20% stronger thanks to the artisan family is really, really strong. Resource-wise, they uh, are looking for gems and dyes, which means they do not need any uh, land consolidation because both of these things can be found uh, and unlocked without land consolidation. The next Greek family is patrons. This is just like the Roman patrons family. And then uh, the sages family is the last one. We haven't talked about this family yet. Each of their cities uh, gets two civics a turn, and they get a science per turn per specialist, and their urban specialists are 20% cheaper. And then probably the strongest part of, family, of this family is in their family seat, the inquiry. They can build the inquiry project. The inquiry project hovering over the tooltip here, gives you science every time you complete it, um, which means if you can set up a city to have some pretty incredible civics production, maybe you find a nice site that has a couple marble, um, build a couple uh, stone cutters there on that marble, maybe build a courthouse, um, and then maybe build one of these shrines that gives you civics, or and if you built a courthouse, maybe this other shrine that gives you a civic per adjacent which is to courthouse, you can actually pump out a lot of uh, inquiries out of a city and just really advance your science rate completely independent of your leader's wisdom, your family's wisdom, cities, and anything. It's it's a really, really nice thing to do with sages' families, finding a way that you can find a city, make it your seat, and then just have it do nothing but produce inquiries after you get its initial worker set up. Very, very strong uh, to play in multiplayer, especially in longer games where you have more time. Generally, you'll want to found Sage's third because of this as your third family, because the other bonus here, you get a random technology, so you want to be as far advanced through the tech tree as you can. Getting a nice tier three tech from your Sage's found can be very, very good um, and can potentially even enable some rushes, though it's not something you can count on because it's random. Greeks start with a commander. Commanders uh, are very solid, especially later on in the game because that XP bonus per idle unit, essentially it's as if every unit were sitting in a barracks or racks. Uh, the capital city can also hurry units with orders. Generally, this one's not useful, but if you're in a standoff situation or you're in a situation where you need to produce a lot of or units fast and you have orders but no units, hurrying units with orders can be useful. And their infantry units are 10% stronger on defense than other uh, units are, as long as the commander is the leader. As a general, they get amazing 50% strength to attack strength while flanking, 
this can create some in let's just if and as a general just as a general they get 20 percent strength while adjacent so a leader general with an adjacent unit and a flanked unit is attacking at plus 70 percent strength probably the strongest single attack you can do in, a, in the game um just because of the flanking and commander so you can you can execute some pretty amazing plays with a commander that has someone flanking uh for the general leader general commander and it, there's just great things there and that XP bonus is very, very nice in later games once you have a lot of military uh, because it's so much XP on it's XP on every unit if that unit is not fighting. So if you're in a standoff situation or preparing for war, you can get a lot of XP on your units. Let's talk about Egypt next. Egypt. This is one of the sieves that I also enjoy playing, largely around because of its unique unit and this bonus here where it gets 400 stone to start. That seems like strange unit but a basic strange bonus but it actually means that egypt can almost guarantee getting the pyramids every game if they want to if the pyramids are available and the pyramids are pretty amazing as a wonder because they reduce the cost of laws by 50 percent. so instead of 400 civics there's 200 civics there's 15 laws in the game that can save you about what 3,000 civics over the course of the game that's a lot of civics probably not going to be playing long enough for all those to matter but even with six laws getting to uu you're looking at a bunch of savings 1200 civics that's a lot of civics that are saved thanks to getting the pyramids early probably one of the better stronger earlier wonders egypt also gets 40 percent from farms on a river which means they're going to need to build fewer farms to get the same amount of food and they get minus 25 percent cost for identical adjacent improvements that means if you build a farm next to a farm on a river if it's next to a farm it's 25 percent cheaper you build your two barracks next to each other the second barracks is 25 percent cheaper it's kind of a nice bonus adds up a little bit um, but the, the big thing about egypt is that stone to secure the pyramids early on or whatever wonder of your choice but generally it's probably gonna be the pyramids which makes a lot of sense because thematically egypt did build the pyramids starting texts are iron working labor force uh, which means egypt is the sieve that can start with slavery right away which means they get an additional five orders right from the bat or as soon as they get the civics for that which is great and then stone cutting as well egypt's unique unit is the light chariot this is a ranged horse unit similar to persia's unique unit except for it doesn't have route and unlike every other unit it can move four moves per order which is really really far it moves really really fast <laughs> the light the light cherry and the kushite cavalry that it upgrades to can zoom across the map because of that um just incredibly fast moving unit um and as ranged horse without route uh can be useful as support um for your unit for your army as well or even in in a group um, because they can move so quickly uh, and just surround. Egypt, just like Persia, has a rider's family, which means if you flank with those fast-moving uh, horse you use that ignores out of control, you can deal extra 25% damage because of the Saddleborn flanking bonus. They also have a landowner's family, just like Rome. Uh, very great for, for starting out, potentially. Um, in multiplayer, I will usually found landowners or riders. Uh, similarly with Rome, I'll usually found champions or landowners because landowners are just so strong at getting your economy up and running early on that two growth uh, from every city but especially in your capital city where your capital city is producing workers and settlers to start out with ability to buy tiles all very very good they have clerics as well uh, similar to persia i usually don't pick this one unless there's something i can do with uh religion and then sages we talked a little bit about inquiry uh with greece egypt can do the same thing uh, setting up an inquiry pump is incredibly strong and uh, very very valuable egypt starts with a builder uh, as a builder they uh, the primary use i think is put uh, your builder you, your builder as an early governor and speed up that one turn to build improvements sort of reminiscent of the artisan family seat bonus of minus two turns to build urban improvements uh, this is one term to build any improvement which means it gets up faster so builders are are one of the two strongest governor archetypes uh, the other one being judge which lets you buy specialists uh, instead of having to build them and then as a leader you can add urban tiles uh, which is somewhat a meme although it can be very useful for expanding your borders um, especially before being able to buy tiles um, and multiple workers can build improvements this generally you'll see in terms of trying to rush out a wonder you can start a wonder and then put two or three workers on it and have or even third the time it takes to build them and then nicely as a leader um, as a builder leader all workers take 50 percent less time to build 
moving on to Carthage. Carthage is a sieve that plays very differently from every other sieve, and that's because it can hire mercenaries from tribes right away. Doesn't need an alliance, doesn't need anything. Uh, it could just hire mercenaries right away, which means as Carthage, if you have some tribes nearby, you can actually ignore military entirely and go purely economy um, and leverage your economy to buy mercenaries when you need them from the local tribes. Um, and otherwise just go pure eco. You can almost think of this like a fast expand sort of strategy where you're trying to expand to the available sites that are, are free without any units. And then when you need to expand to another site, you can just buy mercenaries using your superior economy. And because you're not you're not spending any orders on military early on and any production on military early on, you're hoping that your economy will uh, catapult you to a stronger start. Nicely, uh, Carthage also gets 200 civics per, si per city that it founds, which is very, very strong um, because you're probably going to be founding a couple cities early on in the game and boom, 200 civics right there uh, for each city. So you've got five cities, congrats. You have an extra thousand civics that you pulled out of a hat. Um, Egypt had to build the pyramids and get the pyramids to get that. You just got that for free for playing Carthage. And then also 10 gold per turn per city if it's connected. So if you get them connected to your trade network, you get an extra 10 gold a turn. Uh, that's sort of a nice bonus as well. But the big thing I think for Carthage is really those hiring mercenaries. Uh, you can do that and you should do that because it's it's guaranteed to do, which lets you, again, focus on that pure, pure eco strategy early on and then supplement that with mercenaries when you need them. And importantly, with tribal mercenaries, you can hire them and then you can upgrade them. Uh, if you pull them back into your borders you, and heal, make sure they're healed up, you can upgrade them and tribal units can be upgraded all the way up to six strength. There's no tech requisite, it just takes training. And that can be incredibly powerful, especially if you're playing on a higher tribal settings like strong or raging, where tribes get a little more fatigue and can move more. Um, but even on lower settings, having a six strength unit early on can be very, very strong. Do note though that Steadfast uh, still works against your mercenaries. So if you're facing off against Rome or Greece or anyone with a champion's family, uh, be aware that they will be dealing extra damage to your mercenaries because they are fighting tribal units and Steadfast applies against them. Let's talk about starting techs. Uh, Carthage starts sort of diplomatically oriented. They've got uh, divination and aristocracy, which means they can start with an ambassador. Uh, that's probably not as great in multiplayer as it is in single player. Um, and they also have trapping, which means they can get military drill up pretty quickly, as well as start with camps right away. Uh, they can unlock the build shrines as well early on. Their unique unit is uh, the African elephant or the turreted elephant. This is a mounted elephant, not a horse, uh, that does have route and also panic. Panic is something that is a little confusing to explain, but basically if an elephant hits a unit, that unit will try to run away and move to a tile that's available. Uh, if no tiles are available, it will be stunned, just like the tactician stun. Uh, this can be very useful. Um, importantly, this can push units off tiles. So if you've got your opponent having a fortified onager or a manginel in the fort, super well defended, you can just push it off with an elephant. Um, you can do that with uh, normal elephants as well, but normal elephants don't have route. Uh, Cat Carthaginian elephants do, um, which is very, very nice. Carthage shrines, they have the money net shrine that we talked about earlier, as well as the growth pasture adjacent shrine, um, which is somewhat nice as well. And the uh, he, this shrine, I think we, uh, did I talk about Egypt's shrines? I don't think I did. Um, Egypt has the order shrine, it has the mountain culture shrine, and has the heal idol shrine, which is uh, not particularly useful in one shrine per adjacent grove, except for one growth per turn per adjacent grove, except for groves require land consolidation. So by the time you get land consolidation, you probably don't care about one growth a turn. So this is basically like a healing shrine, um, not particularly useful. And then they have the uh, equivalent of Persia Shrine of Mithra. This is the ranged level shrine. Sorry for not speaking about uh, Egypt's shrines. Coming back here to Carthage's shrines, they have the net adjacency shrine. They have the growth uh, and pasture adjacency shrine, which can be potentially nice. Um, they have that healing shrine, which I'm not too much a fan of, and they have the culture plus money adjacent resource shrine. So despite starting with divination, I don't personally feel that Carthage has particularly strong shrines to note, but uh, they, 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 they are there and they can build them right away. Family-wise, Carthage starts with riders, which means they can go into mounted strategy and their uh, unique unit is also a mounted unit. 
Um, they start with artisans, just like uh, Greece, that they have all the wonderfulness of the artisan family. And they start with a family you haven't chatted about yet, uh, traders. Traders uh, are, are an interesting family in that they are very sort of on a caravan. Caravan is essentially not useful at all in multiplayer. You basically build something with growth and then it slowly walks. Then it slowly walks across the map towards uh, your opponent <laughs> who will hopefully not kill it. And then the opponent will get like 250 gold and you'll get 750 gold or so. And that's it. And, and then it doesn't do anything. Uh, very nice thematically. Uh, in single player, it's much nicer because it has opinion bonuses. But in multiplayer, of course, those don't matter and don't work because you're a uh, human opponent can do whatever they want. Uh, they, they are not going to be stopped from attacking you because of the AI. there is no AI or anything like that. Traders also get a court merchant, which is nice upon founding, um, and uh, upgrade hamlets faster. Perhaps the nicest thing about traders is their unit, their workers, can build multiple roads per turn. Uh, this means multiple roads per year that instead of road, way to turn, road, way to turn, you can just spam a road uh, in a single turn using a bunch of orders. Uh, that's very, very nice in case you want to connect your cities, which, of course, Carthage does because it gets that bonus with connected cities. Lastly, Carthage has statesmen and uh, all the order loveliness that they give. Uh, Carthage starts with the diplomat. Diplomats are uh, of limited utility in multiplayer. Uh, that foreign tribal leader opinion turns into a family uh, tribal leader, uh, tribal, sorry, a family religious leader, I think, a bonus, or at least a family tribal leader. I'm not entirely sure how it converts. Um, pretty, pretty solid. The three charisma is nice for getting additional civics out, um, but not particularly strong uh, in multiplayer. As governors, they can be nice because you get family opinion for appointing them as governors. So if there's a family you need to get your opinion up on, uh, appointing a diplomat governor can be very nice. Let's talk about Babylon. Babylon, this is like the science of, except for, uh, well, let's talk about it. So they gain one science per turn in every city. That is a nice bonus. It's not earth shaking or groundbreaking, but it is nice and is significant and does add up, but it's by no means game changing. And also 20% more growth in every city. This is actually very nice in the early game because it lets you build workers and settlers faster, which are the things you want to do in the early game. Additionally, they get two culture per turn for every treasury that they have. Um, generally, you're not going out of your way to build treasuries. As Babylon, you may want to consider building treasuries because they give you that nice two culture a turn and, and a bunch of extra gold. Um, so the first bonus is probably the more impactful one. The second one is more of a nice to have. Starting tech-wise, they start with trapping, uh, administration, and rhetoric. Rhetoric lets them start with epics, uh, but more importantly, lets them build forums right away, which lets you get additional civic production up and running. In case you have a family uh, that you know you want to focus on civic production, like, hey, look, Babylon has sages. Let's talk about the Babylon unique unit. This is like a mobile onager or manganel, uh, almost. It only has three range instead of four, but it doesn't need to unlimber. It has a little bit of slash damage, which is very, very nice, um, and takes a lot of wood to produce. Um, and... Yeah, it's basically a super archer. Um, so as Babylon, you you have a nice ranged unique unit that you can use to attack from a distance. It has some splash. Um, it's, it's a eight strength archer that's much more accessible in the tech tree than uh, longbow, which is the other, other the normal eight strength archer that you would need to get um, and doesn't start splash. Uh, especially, I think it's worth noting with Babylon, if you can get on your unique unit, the eagle eye and marksman upgrade, then uh, these units will become incredibly strong because they will have four range thanks to marksmen and they will have no fall off to range damage thanks to eagle eye. So be on the lookout for eagle eye and marksmen whenever you're upgrading your Akkadian or Sumerian archers and playing as Babylon. The shrines for Babylon, they've got the science shrine with um, slight variation in that it's a civic per adjacent Odeon. Um, they've got the growth and pasture shrine. They've got the Mountain Culture Shrine, and they've got the uh, Civic Plus Order Per Wonder Shrine. Family-wise, they only have one military family, the Hunters. Um, they don't have champions, they don't have riders, uh, just Hunters. And uh, this can be tied very nicely to their unique unit in that those ranged units start with Sentinel, which is at 20% strength in your friendly borders. They have a unique unit that's ranged. And they have Camps and Nets for extra additional, additional growth production. Uh, artisans as well traders, and uh, similar to Carthage, and sages so that they can complete an inquiry pump 
uh, similar to Egypt and Greece. Sage is a very strong family right now. Babylon starts with a scholar. Scholars are uh, very strong as leaders uh, for a couple reasons. They can tutor children basically for two orders and no cost. Uh, so essentially every kid can get double tutored by the scholar leader and a, and a normal courtier that's tutoring, uh, which means you get more stats and more tutor events on your kids, which means they have more stats and it's, it's just very good. Uh, they also have wisdom, which is very nice. Um, and as a leader, they uh, can redraw text, which is very valuable if you're trying to pick out particular texts on the tech tree, as you might be doing in multiplayer, where you're, you don't want to waste time researching texts that aren't useful to you, as well as unlocking inquiries in the capital. This can be very powerful if your capital has a great civics production, because it means you now have a second source of inquiries if your capital is not a sage's site, um, and or if you're not playing a sage's family, or if you're not playing a nation that has a sage's family, if you have a scholar leader, you suddenly can produce inquiries in your capital, which is very valuable considering how strong inquiries still are right now. Uh, as governors, scholars give two science per turn per archive that effectively is, like, generally you're not going to be building archives. I think it's behind metaphysics, if I remember right, which is, I, yeah, it's behind metaphysics and nice, but uh, pretty niche. And you're never going to assign a governor just to get that unless you're trying to build something in and trying to focus the science, a city on science, except for discontent, reducing science makes that very challenging to do. Uh, also, traders, I think I forgot to mention, they have olives and pearls as their luxuries, so one of them is a land consolidation resource. Last civilization that for, we'll talk about for now, before the eighth one is announced, is um, Assyria. Assyria starts with all their un military units, starting with focus. Focus essentially is a 10% chance to crit, and it means focus has unlocked, uh, so the next focus tier can open up, so and those those tiers are additive on each other. So it starts out with an Assyria unit having 10% chance to crit, and then if it has focus two, it now has 10 plus 15. And if it gets to focus three, then it has now 10 plus 15 plus 20, so now it's a 45% chance to, fo to focus. And focus is essentially double damage. Um, so Assyrian units can be terrifying, and this, uh, especially once they get upgraded, but even from the beginning, they have a 10% chance to do double damage, uh, which can be very, very strong. And they all start with it and it's on all the units. The other nice thing about Assyria is that two orders per military unit killed. Uh, this can fuel a sort of different order economy, an order economy that relies on killing enemy military units, but getting two orders per uh, military unit killed can, uh, can basically enable an attack to continue or enable you to keep an economy running while you're still attacking at the same time. Also 100% pillage yield. Honestly, I almost never pillage, so that's, that's not particularly interesting to me. Uh, but that the order economy and focus just makes it a very strong military uh, nation, as well as uh, the fact that they have two military families, similar to Persia, champions and hunters this time, with two military families. Let's talk starting techs. They start with trapping, which means they can start with slingers right away, um, and administration, as well as military drill, which means they actually have all the prereqs for archers, um, because they can go straight to composite bow, so you shouldn't be surprised if you see a enemy Assyria come at you with a archer rush, uh, focus archers that are highly promoted because they've built a bunch of slingers and then promoted them to archers after killing a bunch of barbs. So now they've got like focus two or focus three. That can be really terrifying because uh, the archers are suddenly have a strong roll chance to do double damage or if they've got a general with some wisdom on them to up their focus chance, that can be really, really terrifying and pump out a lot of damage. You, you better hope you have some trees to hide in. Otherwise, it's going to be pretty scary as well as the fact that they start with military drill, which means they can build barracks, which means their military production can get off the ground faster than anyone else's as well. Assyria's unique unit is a little strange. It is a siege unit that is melee, that only can move one, one move, one move per order. Uh, so it's very, very slow. Uh, of course, siege units can move two moves, can moves double on roads, um, but that, that is uh, pretty, I think that was a recent change. They also start with assault, which means they are really good at attacking into urban tiles like cities and have some defense against ranged units. Um, I honestly can't say I've played much with the battering ram line of units, um, especially multiplayer. They are just very slow. It is hard to justify building something that can only move one move in order because um, it's going to take forever to get to the front lines. Uh, and generally, like attacking a city is not the hardest thing. It's usually killing the units outside the city that are the hard part. Um, I guess they have that assault so they can attack into an urban tile. Um, so if you can get a battering ram up to the 
to the front. Uh, they can be very strong, but of course, as siege units, they take um, additionally, or it's 50% road cost. Okay, sorry. So it's not double movement on roads, 50% move, movement ro along roads. So roads are twice as fast for siege units, um, which I think adds up to double movement along roads. But yeah, I mean, siege units are still weak to mounted units. So if we pull up mounted here, you'll see mounted have 50% melee combat strength versus siege units. So um, a chariot can come up and basically do 50% extra damage to a siege unit uh, in melee. So siege is pretty vulnerable uh, to, to horses. So if you see you have an Assyrian opponent who is building siege towers or battering rams, uh, build some horse units and uh, make them regret doing so. Uh, of course, your horse, and, and they won't be able to run away because, right, the horse units will always catch the siege tower that's slowly trundled along at one move in order uh, where the, the horses move at at least three or so. Assyria probably has the best lineup of shrines of any nation in the game. Uh, they, In terms of military production, they have the uh, training plus XP for idle infantry shrine that Rome has. They have the lumber mill uh, training shrine that uh, Rome and Persia has. They have the order shrine uh, that Persia and Egypt have as well. Um, and then they have the civics uh, and orders per adjacent wonder shrine. Uh, so these two shrines together are just very, very strong. And then the order shrine is really nice. And then this is another order shrine. So if Assyria, you plan out your shrines properly, uh, you can get a bunch of additional orders and a lot of extra training from them. Family-wise, Assyria starts with champions, uh, hunters, patrons, and clerics generally going to be looking at potentially a uh, any of these three can be great founding ones but if you've got some war maybe a champion's founding is pretty good hunters and patrons uh, clerics are also a possibility if you don't want to play with patrons um, any of these three families can work generally you probably want to have champions and hunters to have that double military production um, and get that sentinel bonus on ranged units uh, again as Assyria, the availability of going for a composite bow rush is very possible and having super archers that just destroy things but you can really really do anything with this area and uh, they start with the zealot the zealots are a military archetype they have the nice thing when you have a leader zealot you are essentially as if you ever playing rome because now all your units have one extra fatigue uh, by the way zealot rome is really terrifying because now all their units have two extra fatigue and can just zoom across the map uh, and yeah it's terrifying the other nice things about a zealot is in a state religion city, and this might be a reason for you to pick up clerics if you don't want to target religion manually, or you want to guarantee religion in a large FFA, all their state religion cities can hurry production with training. Uh, any production, whether it's a specialist, a unit, or a project can be hurried, um, which is really nice um, if you have a lot of training production. As a leader general, there is a 10% chance to enlist uh, on kill. This essentially means that instead of killing the unit, the unit just comes over to your side, although it's going to be pretty injured and not able to move that turn. Um, so that's of limited utility, but can be nice. Um, and annoyingly, for leaders, for generals that are not necessarily leaders, uh, zealots can't die unless they have exactly one hit point, uh, which means they're slightly tankier than other generals because you have to hit them again or map out your hits so that you kill them when they have one hit point. Um, so that's that's very nice as well. Uh, there's a couple leader archetypes we haven't talked about because there is no founding city to start. No, no founding, uh, no order, no, no nation that starts with them as one. One is order, uh, the opposite of diplomat in that they don't like each other. Orders have a lot of additional charisma to start out with um, and have the very nice aspect that uh, they get two orders per turn if a family is at the max happiness, max opinion level, a friendly family. In late game, this can be enormous. Let's say you have eight cities and three families, all of which are friendly. You now have extra 16 orders a turn just for having an order leader. Uh, so that's incredibly powerful in terms of giving you a huge amount of extra orders uh, later on. Also, the religions like them, and you can recruit tribal mercenaries just like Carthage can except for it costs you legitimacy which is less great um interestingly order orator governors can also hurry projects with orders um so there are some interesting plays you can do with uh an orator that's tied that's a governor in a patron city because you can hurry uh projects uh with gold there uh or if you don't have a patron city you can uh have an order governor and oh, hurry it with projects i'm sorry hurry it with orders uh which is uh, somewhat useful if you, for some reason, are running a lot of spare orders, although generally that's not a great idea. The big thing about orders really is, is the orders is they have that plus four charisma and the uh, enormous 
order bonus of two orders per turn per friendly per city per friendly family which if you have eight or ten cities just adds up to an enormous amount of extra orders as long as all your families are happy and there's lots of bonuses to keeping your ha families happy uh, so you'll want to be do, it, do that probably not usually doable until the mid game uh, when you have a solid ambassador and maybe have gotten some of the luxuries but incredibly strong if you can pull it off um i think we've talked about all these archetypes the last ones are there's two uh that we haven't talked about and that's judge and scholar uh judges uh are essentially they can hold court as a leader which lets them convert let me actually pull up the page a judge uh can serve as a governor or a chancellor uh the nice thing for judges they're really great as governors um i think i mentioned uh, orders are great as governors. Judges are also great as governors. Builders are also great as governors. Uh, judges and builders, I think, are the two that I always look to see with their governors because getting a one minus one turn on improvements in a city is really nice for a builder, as well as uh, as a governor for a judge. If I'm going to be building specialists in a city, being able to hurry specialists with money so it just takes one turn to build a specialist is incredibly strong. As a leader, uh, judges are a little underwhelming, in my opinion. Uh, switching law cost is reduced generally you don't want to switch laws uh unless there's something particular you're planning like trying to go into a polythe polytheism monotheism play or maybe a late game slavery freedom switch uh, so that's of limited utility and being able to upgrade improvements is also not that useful in that sometimes uh, for some of these improvements you want to have multiple specialists in those improvements uh so it's it's not that valuable to uh, upgrade the improvement but you can do that they can also hold court Old court essentially lets you convert training into civics, which is somewhat useful, um, but I, I don't quite understand how the scaling works on that. And then judges uh, are opposed to schemers, which are also a archetype that does not have a starting civilization right now. Uh, schemers are very strong in that they have the best wisdom of any uh, archetype in the game, and they can use legitimacy to buy orders. They can spend two, uh, two legitimacy to buy 10 orders just once per turn, um, which is very strong and this is perhaps the strongest part of schemers they get two orders per turn per war so if you ran them into a leader that's a schemer early on and you're playing on a map with an ffa um, or you're playing on a map with a lot of tribes each war is going to give you two additional orders which can add up quite a bit um, of course if you're declaring on everyone in an ffa you may want to tell people hey i'm a schemer i'm just declaring on you uh, to get extra orders i'm not actually going to march across the map and attack you right now uh, be warned that some people will not take kindly to being declared on war and will still uh, still take it personally um, but uh, the the orders per war you should definitely just declare on tribes as a schemer just because uh, it's incredibly strong unless you're perhaps next to a tribe where it surrounds you entirely and it would be dangerous to declare on them uh, and I, additionally their scouts are invisible uh, which means they can just freely move through an opponent's territory without being stopped uh, which is pretty pretty incredible leader mission adopt child um you the game will generally throw events at you to try to get you to adopt children if you don't have an heir uh, so this is of a limited utility but if there it, the, it's also weird in how you have to use this mission you have to click into all the children in your empire pick a child and then adopt from there you can't do it from your leader um also very nice for schemers they get 20 percent from all agent yields so if you have a uh, unit in say a gov in an enemy city that has a lot of civic production like maybe their sages seat uh, they have an inquiry pump set up you can you can put a schemer agent in there and get 20 percent extra yields all right so that is a quick overview uh, hopefully quick just under an hour it looks like overview of all the civilizations or nations in old world and a uh, quick look at all the sort of leader archetypes uh, with an eye towards what's good and what's not um, as well as just sort of explaining how they all work in multiplayer as well as applicable to single player uh, appreciate any comments uh, or thoughts that you have please leave them i'll do my best to reply to them and uh, enjoy playing old world it's really a great game and i'm looking forward to seeing more people embrace playing it